Hello friends, today we are going to discuss about the functional areas of cerebrum or cerebral cortex. So coming to this functional areas of cerebrum, so it is very very important thing we are going to discuss. Before going to discuss, please subscribe to my channel and coming to this functional areas, there are three areas are there in that motor areas sensory areas and as well as association areas i just want to show you all these areas in the ppt yes <clears throat> so the entire the cerebral cortex is demarcated into a large number of areas which differ from each other in structure and as well as in function so if you just think about the functional areas uh, so many scientists they have found different areas they have invented a uh, number of areas suppose if you just think about the scientist which uh, called as Economo he has found almost 100 functional areas and at last we are following only the 72 areas which are invented by the Broadman so Broadman he has invented 72 areas so that 72 areas we are discussing now okay so in the 72 areas all the areas they are located in different different regions of the cerebrum called as frontal lobe parietal lobe occipital lobe and as well as the temporal lobe so let us see that one by one before going to see all these areas we must understand there are motor areas also present sensory areas are there then association areas so what are these motor areas are motor areas they are these areas are primarily concerned with the motor functions and give origin to the projection fibers so when you just think about the projection fibers projection fibers so the we have seen the cell bodies of the cerebral cortex so in the previous class we have seen the structure of cerebral cortex in the structure of cerebral cortex we have seen different types of cell bodies called as the small pyramidal cells large pyramidal cells of beds we have seen then we have seen uh, other type of uh, neurons called as ganglionic cells we have seen then pleomorphic layer we have seen and other neurons which we have seen are you can just think about the first layer first laminae we can identify the causal cells horizontal cells of causal we have seen in the first lamina in the second lamina we have seen the granule stellate cells or granule cells we have seen then in the third lamina or third layer outer pyramidal layer we have seen the small pyramidal cells then in the fourth lamina we have seen the medium sized pyramidal cells or st and stellate cells densely packed stellate cells we have seen in the fifth lamina we have seen the medium and large pyramidal cells so these are all nothing but the cell bodies means the neuron somas soma they are present in the cerebral cortex outside part of the cerebrum okay then below this gray matter means cell bodies we can identify the white matter okay the axons of that particular neurons which are extending down and they will call as the all the groups of that axons they call as the white matter so these white matter which is consisting of the axons of that neurons they are joining with each other they are joining with each other means suppose when you just try to see over here so in this part in this picture we can identify the frontal lobe over here then we can identify the parietal lobe occipital lobe then we can identify the temporal lobe so the axons of the particular neurons they may join with the uh, adjacent gyri adjacent gyri called as association fibers if the fibers are joining with the opposite cerebral hemisphere they are called as commercial fibers so uh, now we are seeing the left sided cerebral hemisphere if the white matter if the white matter it is joining with the opposite right side cerebral hemisphere with the same superior frontal gyrus example for example or you can take this prefrontal uh, precentral gyrus if the neurons are 
joining with each other the precentral gyrus neurons are joining with the precentral gyrus of opposite side neurons such fibers are called as commercial fibers i will explain you uh, about that uh, commercial fibers projection fibers and association fibers before going to see that we must understand the functional areas functional areas so the motor areas are these are primarily concerned with the motor functions as you all know that motor functions which carries the action from the brain to the target area then sensory areas these areas are primarily concerned with the sensory functions and receive afferent fibers afferent fibers from thalamic nuclei in which major sensory pathways terminate understand so sensory motor next association fibers areas these areas association areas are not concerned with the primary motor or sensory functions but have more important associative integrative integrative and cognitive functions okay association areas occupy over 75 percent of the total surface area of the cerebral cortex in the human that is about the <coughs> three different areas now what are these three different areas we are going to discuss now so coming to this first motor areas first we will see what are the areas are present in the frontal what are the areas are present in the parietal what are the areas present in the occipital then temporal we, we can see so the first thing first area which we are going to discuss is area number four area number four can you just find out my point over here so here you can see the central sulcus in front of the central sulcus we can identify the precentral sulcus between central and the precentral sulcus the gyrus is called as precentral gyrus so in this precentral gyrus you can identify area number four so this area is called as primary motor area primary motor area so what is present in this is the large pyramidal cells of beds large pyramidal side uh, cells of beds which are present about 40 percent of pyramidal cells pyramidal fibers arise from this area 40 percent of fibers uh, pyramidal fibers so pyramidal fibers are nothing but corticospinal corticonuclear fibers are arising motor right so they are arising from this and extends downwards okay then what about this is the human body is, re is represented in an upside down let me show you another diagram yes so here you can see the primary motor cortex precentral gyrus if you take a section coronal section at the level of the precentral gyrus so what the neurons which present here are cortico uh, spinal and the cortico nuclear fibers right so cortico spinal and the cortico nuclear fibers which are present in this precentral gyrus they are responsible they are responsible to so they are supplying to which parts are it is just like upside down can you just see the diagram over here so legs got up even uh, face got down tongue then pharynx all these things they came down so they are upside down means the neurons which are present at the lower aspect of the precentral gyrus means here it is so here is a precentral gyrus so the lower aspect of the precentral gyrus the neurons which are supplying to that uh, neurons which are present in that particular area lower area they are responsible they are responsible uh, to supply the pharynx and the tongue pharynx and the tongue okay, pharynx is responsible to the swallowing and tongue is responsible for the chewing and mastication then we are moving up and it is supplying to the uh, face can you find out the face over here so i just want to find out yes here you can see that so pharynx then tongue then it is up the nerves which are supplying to the face then after that it is supplying to the head then it is supplying to the hands then it is supplying to the trunk shoulder trunk then after that it is supplying to the knee, thighs knee so we are moving from below to upwards okay so the neurons present over here the lower aspect of the precentral gyrus they are responsible to supply the pharynx then the neurons which are present just above it they are supplying to the tongue the neurons which are just present above it they are supplying to the face the, like that you just try to uh, re, uh, try to remember that okay so then at the medial aspect so when you just think about the medial precentral gyrus 
So try to see here, the central sulcus is present here. So central sulcus, when we are discussing about the sulci and chiri, we were discussing like central sulcus of Rolando, which is extending from the medial surface, upper part of the medial surface, and extending upwards and crossing the superior medial border and extends into superior lateral surface. Okay, so then in front of the central sulcus, we can identify entire this area is called as primary motor area. So here, here in this primary motor area means which is present at the medial upper part of the medial surface, the nerves which are present, the nerves which are present here are the feet, then below the feet you can identify the genitals. Okay, genitals. So that is the reason, that is the reason. Try to remember one thing about it. Okay, so there is a disproportionate registration of the individual parts. The area of the cortex controlling a particular movement is proportional to the skill involving involved in the performing the movement. Try to uh, listen carefully. So one particular area, suppose see here, this particular area of the cerebral cortex, the neurons which are present here, they are supplying to the head and then they are supplying to the face. Try to see here the eyebrows. So, if when just think about the Bharatanatya dancers, they move their eyebrows and show their expression. Okay, so the neurons which are present in this particular area, they are responsible for the movement of the eyebrows. So, it is proportional to the skillful movement. The neurons present in this particular area, they are responsible for the uh, they are responsible for the particular movement of the eyebrows. So it is uh, proportional. Both are proportional. If the neurons are present here more, this applies to the eyebrows more. So this is totally inversely proportional. It does not need the size of that particular muscle. So movement of the eyebrows, it doesn't need the bulk of the muscle. Okay. So that the main action you try to remember. Okay, so that is about the precentral gyrus. Next, we are moving to next. We are moving to premotor area. Next, we are moving to the premotor area. So first, we have seen the primary motor area, area number four. Then we are moving to the premotor cortex, that is area number six of Broadman. So this primary uh, premotor area is located anterior to the primary motor area in the uh, posterior part of superior frontal, middle frontal and the inferior frontal gyrus. Remember the premotor cortex that is area number 6 which is present anterior to the area number 4 or anterior to the primary motor area and this area number 6 which is present posterior to superior frontal gyrus, posterior to the middle frontal gyrus, posterior to the inferior frontal gyrus. Understand? Then the premotor area, premotor area is wider above than below. Try to see here, it is wider above than below. Then it lacks the joint pyramidal cells of beds. It doesn't consisting of joint pyramidal cells of beds, but it is the main site for the cortical origin of extra pyramidal fibers. Extra pyramidal fibers. Here we have seen the pyramidal fibers that is cortico spinal and the cortico nuclear fibers are present in the area number four. Whereas in the area number six we can identify extra pyramidal tracts like cortico rubral, cortico olivary, cortico nigral fibers are present in this area number six. So this premotor area is responsible for successful performance of voluntary motor activities. Okay, so that try to remember that. Then <clears throat> the primary motor area, the primary motor area receives numerous inputs from the sensory cortex, then thalamus and the basal ganglia. So this is a primary motor, uh, premotor area and the primary motor area. So first the primary motor area, the inputs, the receiving things in uh, the afferents which are coming from thalamus. So this primary motor area, it is receiving afferents from thalamus, basal ganglia, basal ganglia and the sensory cortex. Okay, so that is a briefly I am just explaining about it. Then next we are moving to the supplementary motor area, supplementary motor area. So coming to the supplementary motor area, so it is located in the, in the medial frontal gyrus. Let me show you that medial frontal gyrus. So here you can see that. 
supplementary motor area so entire this area is called as supplementary motor area so this is present at the medial frontal gyrus on the medial surface of the hemisphere anterior to the paracentral lobule so it, entire this part is called as paracentral lobule try to recollect the sulci and gyri once again that single eight sulcus which is present above the carpus callosum which is extending upwards from anterior to posterior it is extending anterior to posterior and it is ascending upwards and it is and it is forming the posterior end is ascending upwards and reaching to the uh, reaching approximately the superior superior medial border it is just present anterior to the central sulcus so that area is called as paracentral lobule this supplementary motor area which is present in the medial frontal gyrus medial frontal gyrus anterior to the paracentral lobule anterior to the paracentral lobule so this body is represented before from before backwards in a craniocaudal order then moving to the frontal eyelid area so this part we have discussed and now we are going to this frontal eyelid area number eight so this area number eight it is called as it is in the posterior part of the middle frontal gyrus okay let me show you this yeah here you can see that it is forming the it is present posterior to the middle frontal gyrus posterior to the middle frontal gyrus just anterior to the facial area of precentral gyrus okay so it is present anterior to the precentral gyrus so what it is responsible to is the frontal eyelid area it controls the voluntary scanning movements of the eyes voluntary scanning movements of the eyes and is independent of the visual stimuli the frontal eye field is connected to the visual area of occipital cortex by association fibers you remember this small two lines i will explain you the association fibers once again then you will understand clearly what is all about okay so that is about area number 8 so we have discussed first one is area number 4 I have seen that is primary motor area area number 6 premotor area premotor cortex or premotor area then area number 8 we have seen then <coughs> here you can see the frontal eyelid area frontal eyelid area so this is the frontal eyelid area then supplementary motor area supplementary motor area we have discussed then we are moving to the motor speech area okay motor speech area coming to this motor speech area the part of the frontal lobe rostral to the motor and premotor areas is referred to the prefrontal area uh, this area is concerned with the individual's personality so where it is exactly present is the part of the frontal lobe this is area number 45 and 44 area number 45 and 44 which we can identify okay so this prefrontal area is concerned with the rostral to the motor and the premotor areas is referred as prefrontal area excuse me So now coming to this motor speech area, it is also called as Broca's area. Okay, let me show you this Broca's area. Okay, so the Broca's area, which is present at the lower aspect of the frontal lobe, that is area number 44 and 45. Okay, so when you just think about the sylvian fissure, sylvian fissure, the sylvian fissure is having three ramus. One is anterior horizontal ramus, and then anterior ascending ramus. And then posterior ramus. So between the anterior horizontal ramus and the anterior ascending ramus, that is called as pars opericularis. Then between the anterior ascending ramus and the posterior ramus, that area is called as triangular, pars triangularis. Okay. So in these two areas, which we can identify the Broca's area, or it is also called as motor speech area. Motor speech area that you remember. Then coming to the prefrontal area. So first we have seen four, then we have seen the six, then after that we have seen the eight. So in the medial aspect, which we have seen, the supplementary motor area we have seen, then after that we have seen the frontal eyelid area. Uh, then we have seen the area number 44 and 45. Then rest of the thing that is the prefrontal area. Prefrontal area. So this prefrontal area, which is present anterior to the area number eight and anterior to the 45 and 44 area 
Okay, so the lower part, that is lower part of the frontal lobe, that is inferior frontal gyrus and the middle frontal gyrus, it is and superior frontal gyrus. So entire this area, it is comes under the prefrontal area. So it is responsible for, it is exerting its influence in determining the initiative and judgment of an individual. It is also concerned with the depth of emotions, social, moral, ethical awareness, concentration, orientation and foresightedness. For all these activities, this prefrontal area neurons are responsible. Okay, then this 45 and 44, they are motor speech area. Then you have seen the area number 6, they are extra pyramidal tracts, the cortico rubral, cortico olivary, and cortico nuclear fibers. Then you can identify the pre motor, that is about primary motor, they are responsible for cortico spinal tracts and the cortico nuclear tracts, okay, pyramidal tracts. They are responsible, they, the neurons which are present in the area number 4. Okay, so that is about the uh, motor areas. Then moving to the moving to the functional areas in the parietal lobe. Functional areas in the parietal lobe. So where is parietal lobe? Behind the central sulcus, behind the central sulcus, and in front of in front of occipital parietal sulcus, occipital parietal sulcus. Entire the area above the posterior ramus of the lateral sylvian fissure. Entire this area will come under the parietal lobe. So, what are the functional areas are present in this parietal lobe or area number 3, 1, 2. So, post central gyrus. In the post central gyrus, we can identify area number 3, 1 and 2. So, what is all about? What is this is responsible to is? So, primary sensory area behind the central sulcus, entire this area is sensory. In front of the central sulcus, this frontal lobe will come under the motor area. Okay, the neurons which are present in the frontal lobe, they are responsible for actions. They are taking action from the brain to the target area. Whereas the sensory, I mean, sensory areas which are present behind the central sulcus, the afferent fibers which are coming from the thalamus, basal ganglia, uh, basal ganglia, they are reaching to this, uh, they are reaching to this uh, parietal lobe behind the central sulcus. Okay, so this area which is present, I mean, behind the central sulcus, in the post central gyrus, we can identify area number 3, 1, and 2. Okay, so this area number 3, 1, and 2, they are extending even medially. Okay, extending even medially. So we can see the area number 1 and 3, they are present behind the area number 4. Okay, behind the central sulcus. Okay, then coming to this. So the functions which uh, carries, the which actions. So the nerves which are coming to this sensory area, which nerves are coming, that we will see now. Now, let me show you this primary sensory area which are present in the post-central gyrus, post-central gyrus, that is area number 3, 1 and 2. Okay, so here is a section when we take at the level of the post-central gyrus, how can you identify? It is almost similar with that of uh, pre-central gyrus, that is primary motor cortex. Okay, so the nerves, the afferent fibers, means from the tongue, from the pharynx, from the face, and from the nose, eyes, and forehead, then from the thumbs, then from the shoulder, then we can identify from the trunk. So it is almost similar with that of uh, pre-central gyrus. So here, the motor neurons which are cell bodies are present here in the sensory we can identify the from this areas from these areas the axons are extending axons are extending and reaching to the post central gyrus okay so that is about the post central gyrus or area number 3 1 and 2 then moving to the next area is secondary sensory area secondary sensory area so secondary sensory area is located in the upper lip of posterior ramus. So here you can see the posterior, I mean, the lateral sylvian fissure. It is having uh, anterior horizontal ramus, anterior ascending ramus, then posterior ramus. Okay. So it is located in the upper lip of posterior ramus, posterior ramus of lateral sulcus or sylvian fissure. The face area lies most anterior and the leg area lies most posterior. 
and the whole body is represented bilaterally this area related to the more to the pain perception okay so here you can see that the lateral sylvian fissure posterior ramus this is the upper part of the posterior ramus of sylvian fissure or lateral sulcus that is for secondary sensory area then sensory association area which occupies the superior parietal lobule superior parietal lobule that is area number 5 and 7 they will comes under sensory association area or somatosensory association area so it is concerned with the perception of shape size roughness and texture of objects okay thus it enables the individual to recognize the objects placed in his or her hand without seeing such ability is referred to as a stereognosis stereognosis okay so if you just touching any hard object finding that it is a smooth hard so it is the the sensory impulses that takes the impulse to this particular area area number five and seven okay <clears throat> then coming to the sensory speech area of vernix okay sensory speech area of vernix so the sensory speech area is located in the left dominant hemisphere left dominant hemisphere now we are seeing the left dominant hemisphere only okay so that it is left dominant hemisphere it is responsible for the sensory speech area that is area number 39 area number 39 then area number 40 area number 40 then gyre of inferior parietal lobule so this is inferior parietal lobule and this area is for the sensory speech area okay so the vernix area is concerned with the interpretation of the la uh, interpretation of the la uh, language through visual and auditory input it is also an essential zone for constant availability of the learned word patterns okay so vernix area remember that is present in the inferior parietal lobule area number 39 and area number 40 okay so then <clears throat> the angular and supramarginal gyrus so here you can see that so the lateral sylvian fissure the posterior ramus which is extending back and enters into the inferior parietal lobule so surrounding that it is called as uh, supramarginal gyrus and the angular gyrus so the superior temporal sulcus it is also extending upwards and enters into the inferior parietal lobule so surrounding this two ramus two sulci one is the posterior ramus of sylvian fissure then the posterior end of superior temporal sulcus okay these two areas they are called as angular gyrus and the angular gyrus and the supramarginal gyrus okay angular and the supramarginal gyrus exactly the location of this is so anteriorly anteriorly means the posterior ramus which is covered by supramarginal gyrus and uh, posterior end of superior temporal sulcus is surrounded by angular gyrus these two angular and supramarginal gyri are essential for the process of learning such as reading writing and computing okay so the lesions of these areas produce wide variety of aphasic disorders like disabilities in reading writing okay disability in reading called as alexia and disability in writing called as agraphia disability in computing is called as acalculia and recognition disability in recognition of name of the object called as anomia okay so lesions of both the brocas area and the vernix brocas means here it is present area number 44 and 45 which is present in the frontal lobe and the sensory area is called as vernix area area number 39 and 40 so the lesions if the lesions are present in this 44 45 and 39 40 they results uh, in the loss of production of speech okay as well as the loss of understanding of the spoken and written speech that is about the parietal lobe then moving to the temporal lobe so first we have seen the frontal lobe then we have seen the parietal lobe then moving to the temporal lobe so in the temporal lobe we can identify area number 41 and 42 so here you can see area number 41 42 so these two areas are these two areas are now moving to the areas of the temporal lobe okay so area number 41 and 42 
area number 41 and 42 they are called as primary auditory areas so here you can see that area number 41 and 42 they are occupying the lower aspect of the posterior ramus of sylvian fissure okay so upper aspect we can identify the the two areas that is 39 and 40 39 and 40 which are responsible for sensory speech area below that we can identify 41 and 42 which are present in the temporal lobe okay they are responsible for primary auditory area so this primary auditory area which are occupying which are occupying superior temporal gyrus superior temporal gyrus then anterior transverse temporal gyrus anterior transverse temporal gyrus and extends slightly to the adjacent part of the superior temporal gyrus okay then the it receives the afferents from medial geniculate body through auditory radiations medial geniculate body receives input from organ of corti in the cochlea of inner ear of both sides but mainly from the opposite side suppose if it is left side i mean exactly it is left sided one it receives from the right side whereas right side it receives from the left side okay so this area is concerned with the reception of isolated impressions of the loudness of voice and quality and pitch of the sound okay that is about primary auditory area is 41 and 42 then secondary auditory area which is area number 22 area number 22 which is occupying the superior temporal gyrus so the anterior part of the superior temporal gyrus is occupied by area number 22 it receives auditory impulses from primary auditory area okay and correlates with them with the past auditory experiences okay thus this area is necessary for the interpretation of the sound heard okay so when you listen any sound suppose any scary sound okay so the first time you might be you might have uh, scared a lot but the so second time third time will we does we doesn't scare in such a way because the neurons which are present here the neurons present here area number 41 and 42 they as they again from this area number 41 and 42 they sense to the area number 22 okay so we'll re remember that remember that particular sound and we'll interpret that one interpretation of that sound heard okay so the previous experiences previous experiences they are present in the area number 22 okay area number 22 then moving to the area number 17 that is primary visual area which is we are going to the occipital lobe so we are moving to the occipital lobe so in the in the temporal lobe we have to remember area number 41 and 42 area number 22 these three areas we remember in the temporal lobe in the parietal we have seen 312 then 40 uh, 39 and 40 43 we have 43 we are going to see then area number 7 we have seen right then coming to the occipital loop occipital loop that is area number 17 18 and 19 first we will discuss about area number 17 so that is about primary visual area primary visual cortex or primary visual area it is situated in the walls and the floor of the posterior part of the calcarean sulcus here you can see the calcarean sulcus yeah so you know this one it is nothing but the primary visual cortex okay so posterior part of the calcarean sulcus and may extends around the occipital pole uh, on the superior lateral surface of cerebrum here you can see that okay so the most marked uh, structural feature of the visual cortex is presence of white striae or visual striae of gennari hence the name the striae area striate area so the visual cortex is relatively thin and contains huge amount of granule cells huge amount of granule cells are present in this area number 17 so <clears throat> this visual cortex receives afferent fibers from the lateral geniculate body via geniculocalcarine tract or optic radiations then visual cortex receives fibers from temporal half of the ipsilateral retina and the nasal half of the contralateral retina thus right half of the field of the vision is represented in the visual cortex of the left cerebral hemisphere and left one it is going to the right one okay it is also important to know that note that impulses from the superior retinal quadrants pass to the superior wall of the calcarean cells 
for that you can see you have to see here remember it is a visual primary visual cortex right side one it goes to the left side left side one goes to the right side so that is blindly you can remember that okay area number 17 then moving to the area number 18 and 19 that is secondary visual area okay secondary visual area so secondary visual area surrounds the primary visual area and occupies most of the remaining visual cortex in the medial medial surface so here you can see that try to find i'll show you here yeah, here so 17 is surrounded by 18 and 19 okay these are secondary visual areas so these areas receives afferent fibers from primary visual area and it relates to the visual information received from the primary visual area to the past visual experiences as you have seen the area number 41 and 42 and 22 in the same way so here what is happening is from the 17 area the nerve fibers which are extending into the 18 and 19 okay so that is about the functional areas of the cerebral so other areas are what we are going to discuss are the taste area or gustatory area is located where the gustatory area is located is so area number 43 area number 43 so this gustatory area is located inferior to the parietal lobe posterior to the general sensory area for the mouth or in the lower end of the post central gyrus post central gyrus okay so lower part of the post central gyrus is occupied by the area number 4 it is receiving afferents it is receiving afferents uh, from the tongue from the tongue and from the mouth okay so taste taste sensation it is going to this area number 4 then vestibular area is probably located near the part of the post central gyrus which is concerned with the sensations of the face vestibular area okay then olfactory area it is located in the anterior part of parahippocampal gyrus so here you can see that olfactory areas area number 34 and 28 they will come under the olfactory areas okay so this is a briefly i have explained i did not explain you in detail again we are going to discuss one by one in your further classes so please uh, once again you take your textbook once again you read after seeing this video once again you read and study and try to draw the diagram and practice this thank you dear students